Every tear falls down for a reason, but I promise I won't cry for you. Chapter 10. Harry joined his friends for lunch, but refused to tell them of what he had been doing, and once more begged off, returning to the room of requirement for the rest of the afternoon. He spent several more hours practising different spells without his wand, and by the time he had to leave for dinner, he had a good grasp on most of the first year's and second year charms, and a few minor hexes and jinxes. His next stop would be to see if he could transfer the theory of wandless magic over to the Animagus transformation, and that would have to wait until later. Line break. The next week passed by slowly for Harry. He was only too thankful that defence was only twice a week. Ambridge was testing his patience, trying to instigate a confrontation. He wasn't rising to the bait, however, utilising all of his occlumency training to remain calm. They had a DA meeting on Wednesday, after supper that week. Harry and the other leaders had spent some time going over their lesson plans, but in the end it wasn't really that different from before Ombridge's decree. Everyone in the club was happy that they were still learning, as they all left the room to head back to their dormitories before curfew. It felt good to know that they were preparing for the worst. Even if the Ministry wasn't acknowledging Voldemort's rebirth, the story had still circulated. Most of the students believed Harry and Cedric over the Minister. It helped that Madame Bones was supporting their version of events as well. Harry feared she might have to face retribution from Fudge for that, before they managed to sack him. But Susan laid his fears to rest, telling him that her aunt had been a staple at the Ministry for many years, and even Fudge knew that if he sacked her, it would just make more people willing to believe her claims. Line break. Harry once more secluded himself in the Room of Requirement on Saturday morning. He knew he had been neglecting Ginny and his own work over the week, but he really wanted to see if his theory on wondrous magic would pan out. He forgot even about Sirius's reminder to always practice with someone else, just in case. For several hours, he focused on the feeling he remembered from the previous week. He imagined his arm growing fur, his nails turning into claws, and his hand into a paw. He saw no change until just before lunch. He was starting to think about leaving it for now, and was coming back after he'd eaten. When it happened. Giving it one more go, he opened his eyes to see his arm turning black as fur sprouted, his hand shortening slightly as his nails lengthened. He grinned happily and flexed his claws, trying to get used to the feeling. After a few minutes, he decided to meet up with his friends, so he closed his eyes once more and imagined returning his arm to normal. It took a little bit longer, but it, ha but it happened. He made sure the transformation was complete before he left the room and headed for the Great Hall. Ginny had felt his elation, but didn't ask him about it, knowing that he had been working on a special project, and that he had promised to share with her, if it worked out. Taking in the grin that he had on his face as he sat down next to her, she guessed that it had. You're awfully happy, she noted, as she continued to eat her meal as they spoke through their bond. Yeah, Harry replied, serving himself and beginning to eat. I had a good morning. Anything you want to share? Ginny asked. Harry nodded mentally. Soon, he promised. When we get some time alone, I'll share it all with you. Ginny was content with that, and they returned to their meals. The rest of the weekend was spent doing homework, planning for the DA and Quidditch practice. Line break. With everything that had been going on over the last couple of months, Halloween snuck up on Harry before he had realised it. He didn't feel like celebrating with the rest of the students at the feast that evening. So he asked Dobby to help him set up a nice dinner in the room of requirement for him and Ginny. Ginny met him there as everyone else headed down to the Great Hall. Harry, this is beautiful, she admired, taking in the setup of the room. There were candles around the room, as well as a few pumpkins floating in the air. The setting was an outdoor patio scene, with a single table set for two. The soft music was playing in the background, making her wonder if there was a wireless hidden somewhere. It reminded her of one of the movies she had watched with her at Harry's place over the summer. It looked like a scene from a film set in Paris. The only thing missing was the Eiffel Tower in the background. Harry smiled and pulled the chair out for her to sit down. They enjoyed their quiet meal, talking both out loud and through their bond. When they had finished, Harry stood up and held out his hand to Ginny. Care to join me for a dance? He asked impishly, smiling Ginny's favourite smile. Full of a boyish handsomeness and charm, with a hint of deviousness. She nodded and took his hand. The table melted into the stones and Harry pulled Ginny close as they swayed to the gentle beat of the music. Is there a wireless in here? 
Ginny asked mentally, resting her head on his shoulder. Harry briefly contemplated how much she had grown. He was getting up there himself, and though he would never match up to Ron, he felt at he would at least be a respectable height. Ginny was a few inches shorter than him, but she had definitely grown a lot since their dance at the Yule Ball the year before. He placed a kiss onto the top of her head before hugging her even closer. I'm not really sure, he admitted in his mind. I asked the room for some music to play in the background. I don't really know how it works. Ginny smiled, feeling completely content in his arms. Well, I'm glad it does. This room is amazing. Harry nodded his agreement, and they remained silent as they continued to dance for a while longer. Eventually, Ginny pulled away and led Harry back to the table, which reappeared for them willingly, now cleared of the remainder of their meal. They sat down, still holding hands. Spill, Harry. What is it you've been working on for the last couple of weeks? Harry bit his lip, contemplating how to present his self-study to her. After a few minutes, he stood up again, pulling Ginny with him. He concentrated briefly, and Harry watched as the room changed around them, transforming to the plain but warm and comforting room she had seen several times over the last year. A single sofa was in front of a fireplace burning merrily against one wall. Harry led Ginny over to the sofa and pulled her down with him. Ginny, have you ever thought about how we perform magic? Ginny frowned, shaking her head. Not really, she admitted. We wave our wands in a specific way, say an incantation, and if we do it correctly, the spell works. Harry shook his head slightly. I've been thinking about it recently. None of us have made any real progress in our animagus practice, and a few weeks ago, I realised that the transformation is more like wandless magic than anything else. Essentially, that's what it is, right? Ginny nodded a little, understanding him to this point. Harry continued, his voice growing more excited as he shared his studies with his... Wife. Wow, that would take some getting used to. A couple weekends ago, I spent a lot of time in here to see if I could do it. Do what? asked Ginny for clarification. Harry smiled, turning to the empty space between them and the fireplace. Ginny gasped quick, quietly in surprise as the table appeared, with a single feather lying on top of it. Without saying anything, Harry pointed at the feather. Ginny gasped again, this time in astonishment as the feather rose several feet off the table, hovering in the air steadily for a few moments, before lowering back down. Harry looked back at Ginny, to see her eyes widen her expression, amazed. She was still staring at the feather. Gin? Ginny looked up, startled. She smiled slightly. Sorry, Harry, it's just... I was always told that wondrous magic was impossible for most wizards and witches. Only that really powerful could do anything without their wands. Harry shook his head. The more I think about it, the more I think that's not true. He reached over and picked up the feather, running his fingers through it as he elaborated. I really think that wantless magic is something we all have the capability of achieving. I mean, if I were to posit that the Animagus transformation is a form of wantless magic, and that the Animagus transformation is something that all witches and wizards are theoretically capable of, then it would lead to the conclusion that wandless magic is something that all witches and wizards are capable of. Understood? Ginny nodded. It made sense. Harry continued. Even if not many witches and wizards become an MHI, I think everyone is capable of it. It's just so hard that not many want to take the time to learn it. Or have the inclination to finish the process. I think we're all taught so early in the development of our magical cause to use magic with a wand. I think we become blind to anything else. If we learnt as children that we could perform magic without a wand, I don't think we would have any trouble with the concept. It's more about intent than waving our wands and saying a few words. After all, how is accidental magic performed? Ginny nodded again. It's wandless, she concurred. Harry chuckled a little, setting the feather back down and taking Ginny's hand in his. There's a muggle saying that's pretty well known. Aerodynamically, the bumblebee shouldn't be able to fly. But the bumblebee doesn't know that, so it goes on flying anyway. If we didn't think it was impossible, would we have so much trouble with it? Ginny shook her head. You're right, she agreed. Did you manage to get any further with the transformation? Harry nodded. It took me a while to get the feel of my magic down. But once I did, I managed to figure out how to do the spells wandlessly. After that, I was able to transfer the theory to the transformation. 
He stopped talking, closing his eyes and concentrating hard on turning his arm into that of a panther. Ginny's gasp told him that he had been successful. He opened his eyes and looked at his arm. It was once more black and furry, with a paw at the end. He flexed his claws and grinned at Ginny. Can you show me? Ginny's voice was quiet, mixed with excitement and a little bit of fear. Harry nodded, turning his arm back to that of the human, with noticeably less effort than it had taken the last time. Pull out your wand, he instructed. Ginny did so, and then, as Harry instructed, began casting the levitation charm oh, several times at the feather, with instructions to concentrate on the feel of the magic running down her arm as she cast the spell. I just tried immediately to perform the magic without a wand. I think it took me longer because of that. I think if you focus on the feeling of magic with a wand, it'll be easier to transfer the theory over to wandless levitation. After casting the spell over and over for almost half an hour, Ginny thought she knew what Harry was talking about. There was a tingle that she could feel in her veins. It reminded her a little of the first time she flew a broomstick. Harry chuckled a little as she shared that thought with him. I thought about our bond when I felt it, he admitted. Ginny smiled. Now what? she asked, lowering the feather back to the table. Harry held out his hand and Ginny willingly placed her wand into it. He set it down next to him then used his hands to raise her arm so that he was pointing at the feather. Do it exactly as you were. Just picture the magic flowing down your arm and into the feather. You can say the incantation if you want. I think it'll be easier for you to say it, at least at first, especially as you haven't had much practice with non-verbal spells yet. He let go of her arm. Ginny nodded, furrowing her brow and concentrated on the task at hand. Nothing happened. Undeterred, she kept pointing at the feather and saying the words, Wingardium Leviosa, over and over. For over half an hour, for over an hour, the two sat there, Harry just letting her try and being there for support. When Ginny started to get frustrated, Harry once more took hold of her arm. Just relax and concentrate on the feeling. Like a tingle, right? Ginny nodded, glancing over at him. She was momentarily deterred to see his face so close to hers. Harry smiled. Feel that tingle moving down your arm and picture it going from there to the feather. Imagine the feather rising into the air. Clearly picture what you want to happen. Ginny turned back to the feather and following Harry's advice, she did it. The feather rose shakily off the table a few inches. She gasped in surprise and the feather fell back down. I did it, she said happily. Harry smiled and gave her a kiss. A little more practice and we'll see if this helps you with the transformation. But right now, I think we're about to be caught out after curfew, and that just wouldn't look good, me being a prefect and all. There was an impishness and mischievous tone to his voice, and he was smiling. Ginny returned the grin, and the two of them headed back to Gryffindor Tower. Thanks for spending the night with me, Harry said over their bond as they approached the fat lady. I really didn't want to be around all the festivities tonight. Ginny nodded, squeezing his hand tightly in comfort. I'm always there for you, Harry however you need me. Harry smiled a little, giving the password to the portrait in E.D. his girlfriend. Wife. Yeah, he probably should not think about her as his wife, in case he accidentally slipped up and said it out loud at some point. You know, before last year, I didn't really think about tonight being the night, you know, my parents died. The only thing my aunt and uncle ever told me was that they were drunks who died in a car crash. Ginny mentally growled at his former guardians, causing Harry's smile to widen a little as they sat down on a sofa by the fire. They gave greetings to their friends who had been waiting for them, but all of them immediately returned to their homework or reading afterwards, knowing that Harry didn't really feel like talking. Last year, everything got upstaged by the tournament, but this year it just really hit me, you know? Ginny nodded mentally. We're all here for you, Harry. She said no more, and just moved over to sit with Hermione, and the two girls struck up a conversation about a potion essay that Ginny had to complete before her next class with Snape. Harry found himself sitting next to Neville. Of all his friends, he really felt like Neville and he understood each other the best. Susan also knew what it was like to lose her parents, but she had grown up in a loving home with her aunt Amelia. Neville had been slightly ostracised by his family during his childhood, scorned for his perceived lack of magic. Of course, Harry knew that wasn't the case, as he had seen many times over the last year. All Neville needed 
was a little bit of confidence. And his own wand. That had definitely helped. Ron, Hermione, Ginny. As much as they all wanted to understand, they really didn't. They could sympathise, and he could appreciate that a lot. But they couldn't understand. You all right? asked Neville quietly. Harry looked over at his friend and nodded. Yeah, he replied just as softly. I think today is always going to be tough. But my parents gave their lives for me. They died defending what's right. I owe it to them and to myself not to let that sacrifice be in vain. Neville understood, not needing any more elaboration. After a moment, Harry turned the question back to the long bottom air. What about you? You and Susan have seemed a little distant lately. Neville bit his lip, looking down at his lap for a moment. We broke up, he admitted. Ron, Hermione and Ginny all turned to him, hearing the statement. What happened? asked Hermione, closing the book. You seemed to be doing so well. Neville shrugged. I do like her a lot, but we both agreed we're just not ready for serious yet. We're still friends, and we both promised that it wouldn't affect the group. We can still hang out together, and we won't get mad if the other decides to date someone else. I'm not mad, and neither is she. It was a mutual agreement. Harry nodded, understandingly. Honestly, he probably shouldn't have been surprised. For all he had found his summit at the age of 14, he had to admit that was rather strange. He and Ginny just got along so well. They understood each other in a way not many understood. Even Ron and Hermione had fights every now and then. Harry still maintained that that was their way of flirting, but only in the peace of his own mind. He didn't fancy Hermione hexing him for voicing that thought. Even if, generally speaking, witches and wizards tended to marry earlier in life than muggles, 14 was still pretty early. Most people needed the time to grow and mature on their own before they could think about sharing their life with another person. Hermione voiced her condolences before wishing them all a good night and departing for the girls' dormitory after giving Ron a peck on the lips. Ginny was the next to leave, kissing Harry before giving Ron a pointed glare that he couldn't even misunderstand. He mumbled a good night before leaving his two dormmates alone. Harry smiled, really pleased at the amount of understanding that his group of friends had. So, what are you thinking? He asked once they were alone. Neville sighed. I don't know, Harry, he admitted. In all honesty, I really do like Susan, a lot, and I could see myself ending up with her. I just know that I'm not really ready for that amount of commitment yet. We can't all be you, he said at the end, taking the bite out of the words. Harry nodded in his understanding. Hey, I know Ginny and I are weird. We found each other early. I think both of us has experienced enough pain and hardship to mature earlier than our peers. While he had told his friends about his childhood, this was really the first time he had acknowledged Ginny's first year. The two of them had talked about it a little over the last year, and he knew that she had come to terms with what had happened, what she had been forced to do. But it wasn't something she liked to talk about, especially with outsiders. You two should take all the time you need. So, if that does happen... You'll both be ready for it. Because I can tell you, mate, it's pretty amazing. He grinned unabashedly and never recognised the look of pure love in his bright green eyes. It was the look he had whenever he thought of Ginny. Neville nodded his agreement. We agreed that we can see other people if we want, and we won't get mad or jealous. If it's meant to be for us, it will happen. And it will still happen in a year or two. Harry stood up, and Neville followed suit as they headed upstairs. If you ever want to talk, I'm here. They paused outside the fifth-year dorm. Thanks, replied Neville, before they opened the door and headed for bed. Line break. The week had been going so well, Harry thought ruefully, as he headed towards the transfiguration classroom, holding a note in his hands, doing his best not to wrinkle the parchment in his clenched fist. It had been a pretty good week. Potions class on Monday had been pretty good, with Ron and Neville both successfully completing the assignment, and the Gryffindors only losing ten points. He actually managed to stay awake through History of Magic, and Hagrid had finally returned late Monday night 
just in time for Harry and his friends to have him for care of magical creatures on Tuesday. The five Gryffindors had snuck out to see him and to learn where he had been. Susan had patrol duty with Terry Boot from Ravenclaw that evening, so couldn't join them. But they had caught up with her the next day. Giants! It was a little worrying that the Death Eaters seemed to have gotten the giants on their side, but Harry was happy to see his large friend, even if he did look like he had gone through several rounds with a giant and lost horribly. Harry arrived at the Transfiguration classroom just as the class of the day got out, and he drew himself out of his thoughts. He let the class of Seventh Year Hufflepuffs pass by before he went inside, closing the door behind him once he saw that there were no lingering students. Minerva turned around and watched her ward approach cautiously. She sighed. What happened? She asked, resigned that something had, by his stance and worried expression, had happened. There was a hint of anger in there as well. Harry bit his lip, handing her the note. Minerva's brow furrowed as she read. Looking up, she motioned for him to take a seat. Tell me what happened, she all but commanded. Harry took the offered seat. She's been trying to get a reaction out of me all term, he started. I've been using my occlumency skills to try and stay calm and not rise to the bait. I know she just wants a reason to discredit me. So, what changed today? Minerva asked, not unkindly. Harry sighed, looking down. She insulted my parents. Said they deserved all they got. Minerva hissed, her eyes narrowing. Harry looked up, a few tears gathering in his eyes. He could take insults to himself, but not his parents. Not after what they had sacrificed for him. Vernon's sister March could certainly attest to his reaction to insults on his parents. She also said that Sirius belonged in prison and should never have been released. Minerva clenched her teeth, forcing herself to remain calm. While I certainly understand your reaction, unfortunately, Dolores is within her rights to give detentions and take points. It says here that she has given you a week's worth of detention and taken 50 points from Gryffindor. Please, Harry, just keep your head down and don't react to her taunts. You know it's what she's looking for and you know she's just spouting lies. So please don't rise to the bait. She sounded so distressed and unlike the calm and put together transfiguration mistress, but Harry just nodded and gave her a light, one-armed hug, which she returned gratefully. Harry left to get to dinner before he had to report for his first attention. He managed to wolf down some chicken and potatoes before saying goodbye to his friends and heading back to the defence classroom. Umbridge was waiting for him with a sickening smile on her face. She gestured to the desk directly in front of her. Have a seat, Mr Potter. I've taken the liberty of setting up your desk. You will be doing lines. Harry nodded slightly, feeling a knot in his chest to loosen just a little bit. Lines weren't so bad. He took a seat, setting his back down before picking up the rather large quill. Umbridge's smile widened. You will be writing. I will respect my betters. Harry grit his teeth, but nodded. How many times? He asked, forcing the words out and trying not to growl. Oh, enough times for it to sink in, Umbridge replied sweetly. Harry could almost feel his jaw groan from the amount of pressure he was putting on it. Looking down at the parchment, he noticed another issue. Professor, you haven't given me any ink. Umbridge's smile, if possible, got even more sickening. You won't be needing any, she said. Harry didn't respond and just nodded and started to write. As he completed the first line, a searing pain across his right hand caused him to pause before his eyes. The words he had just written appeared in blood on the back of his hand. They were only visible for a second, however, before they faded back into his skin, leaving the back of his hand just a little bit redder than before. Is there a problem?
problem, Mr. Potter? Harry looked up at Umbridge's query and shook his head, returning his gaze to the parchment in front of him. He wouldn't give the toad the satisfaction of knowing that he was freaking out. Across the bond, Ginny felt Harry's pain and her own worry and fear spiked. She abandoned her charms essay, sitting straight up. Harry, what's wrong? Harry heard her, but didn't really want her to know what was happening. I'm fine, Jin. I'll talk with you later tonight. While he spoke, his quill never wavered. Thanks to the Dursleys, he was pretty well equipped to handle pain. But that didn't mean he liked the fact that he was slicing his hand open over and over again. Ginny gasped. She barely even acknowledged the fact that this was the first time she had been able to see what was going on around Harry when they were in different places. A blood quill! Harry, those are illegal! She can't just... I'm fine, Jin. Harry replied firmly, not questioning her knowledge. Please, just leave it until I get back to the common room. Harry felt Ginny nod, though he knew she wasn't happy about it. Harry lost track of time as he wrote line after line in what he knew to be his own blood. Finally, Umbridge called him up to her desk, which he did reluctantly. She tutted a bit, examining his hand as he forced himself not to flinch. I really don't think you've gotten the message yet, Mr. Potter. I will see you again tomorrow night. Harry didn't reply, just nodded shortly and turned around, exiting the room as quickly as possible, barely stopping long enough to grab his book bag. As he expected, Ginny was waiting for him in the common room. It was just past midnight and the rest of their friends were no doubt already in bed. Harry took note of the expression on Ginny's face and knew he would have to tread carefully. Ginny. He trailed off, taking a seat next to her. Ginny didn't reply. By the light of the flickering fire in front of them, he could see many emotions in her troubled eyes. After almost a full minute of silence, Harry tried again. Ginny, I'm sorry. That caused a reaction. Ginny shuddered slightly and turned to look at Harry. Her gaze was so pained it caused him to cringe. Harry, don't, don't apologise for that, that woman. But you need to tell Professor McGonagall and Sirius and Madam Bones. Umbridge can't be allowed to get away with this. Harry shook his head slightly. Ginny, please. His voice was strained. Aunt Minerva told me to keep my head down. It's just one week and then I'll be done with it. Ginny stared at him for a few moments, her eyes searching. Let me see your hand, she demanded, holding out her own in expectation. Harry didn't want to, but he obliged her. Ginny ran a finger gently over the reddened skin. Through her emotions, he could feel her anger, her worry, her pain, all for him. He didn't want her to hurt. He pulled his hand out of her grasp and leaned forward, giving her a gentle hug. They stayed that way for a while longer, before Harry pulled back. He took a look at her beautiful face, tears running down her cheeks, and carefully wiped them away. I'll be all right, Jin, he whispered, pressing his lips gently to one of her tear-stained cheek and then the other. The salty taste lingered on his lips as he pulled back. Ginny shook her head, new tears forming in her eyes. Harry, what she's doing is illegal. You have to go to McGonagall. No, Jin. Harry's voice was lined with steel. I won't give her the satisfaction. Ginny knew that was the end of the conversation that night for that night. But she wouldn't give up. Every member of her family could attest to it. She was quite a stubborn girl. Both teenagers went to bed soon after, feeling completely mentally and physically exhausted. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that because yeesh, that last bit was not fun to record. Well, the Harry and Ginny bit was, but not the Umbridge quill bit. Oh boy, packed chapter that one. And I respect Neville and, and Susan for doing this. Just that breakup was so amicable. It has to be one of the most amicable breakups I have ever heard. I'm impressed. And of course, Umbridge making me want to.
punch her in the nose. I'm not a violent person, but God. Talk about someone written to be unlikable. And, of course, a progression in her and Jenny's powers as well. She was able to see through his eyes. Anyway, you guys know the drill. Remember to keep watching my other videos. And to like, comment and subscribe. Hit that bell to get notified. And, yeah. And make sure my guys, gals and non-binary pals to have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.